Do you like the reality I created for you? I have gained the power to alter reality, to make it whatever the people wish for. The old reality was cruel and unfair. Don't you understand? Think about it. You both have dreams, no? I have the power to make them come true. My reality can become just the way you like. Hard to believe that Persona 5 Royal is about five years old to this year. But it is, and I have to say, looking back on it, I still enjoy the game. Sure, the Persona series has its growing pains, but with the release of Persona 3 Reloaded and its DLC that's upcoming soon, that'll cover the FES section, I can't help but think of Persona again. That and the fact, looking at some villains that I really enjoyed, I figured we'd go back to an older topic that I touched on a few years ago, Maruki. Before we continue, I have to give you guys the standard spoilers for endgame content for Persona 5 Royal. Well, throughout the video, we'll be talking about stuff about the entire game. Granted, this is a game that's five years old and I've already spoiled the plot of Persona 5 Royal with not only the title, the thumbnail, and even the opening montage. Oh well, sorry about that. Well, not really. Anyway, we're talking about Persona's greatest villain, Maruki. So let's get this properly done. Who is Takuto Maruki? He's an additional character introduced in Persona 5 Royal, a new confidant who is of the additional Counselor Arcana, which isn't in the main deck of tarot cards. Granted, it's in the El Gran Esterico set, and I know I butchered that, you don't need to leave a comment, and it's in the same vein as the Magician Arcana. I won't go into the meanings of the Counselor Arcana since they do actually reflect Maruki as a character, when upright the card can show off the following traits. Diplomacy, possibility of choice, persuasion, and power over mental illness. Keep this in the back of your head, we'll be going to these later in the video. It's fitting that Maruki is a counselor, as when we're first introduced to the character, he's being signed on at the school where our protagonists go, Shujin Academy. My name is... Huh? My name is Takuto Maruki. Thank you for welcoming me to your school. <laughs> and he's not really the threatening kind of guy now, is he? And he shouldn't be. After all, he's here to help the students, especially those who had to deal with the trauma of Kamoshida, the game's first boss and resident jackass who had sexually assaulted high schoolers. Obviously, that's really messed up, so getting a counselor to talk to the student body, especially the students who were involved with the incident, is important to do. It's pretty much the only good thing that the principal did before he died. And thus, there's a connection made. All with the promise of free snacks. Ah, but if you come to my office, you can have free snacks. All you can eat would be nice, but there's still plenty to be had. So, how about it? Tell me more of these snacks. Hey, don't fall for that. Mmm, truly the most diabolical evil genius. But yeah, the game takes it so that the player can easily connect with Maruki and goes into the whole social link system that the Persona series has been doing for quite some time, ever since 3. And during your sessions, we learn that Maruki is doing research on matters of the heart, trying to understand where the pain of emotions come from and how to counteract it. And it's not just the player character who has these sessions with Maruki. Each of the Phantom Thieves have their own sessions with him, each of them talking about their problems that are related to the plot, like with An talking about how Shiho almost took her life at the hands of Kamoshida and how she feels responsible for this. Ryuji expresses about his leg injury that ruined his dreams of getting a scholarship or track and field to make things easier for his mother. Makoto talks about the difficulties of having lost her parents with her older sister taking care of her. Futaba learns that Maruki has an interest in cognitive science, and he learns about Futaba's mother who had also studied the same subject but passed away due to cognitive science being abused by one of the major antagonists of the story. Haru expresses her loneliness, especially with her family and with her father passing away throughout the story. Even Yusuke, who's not even a student of Sujin Academy, gets on and on the action by expressing wanting to show the painting of his mother to the world, as well as finding a wonderful master who can help him with art. I bring all this up as each of these scenes showcases each member of the Phantom Thieves, establishing a connection with Maruki, and even expressing an element of their personalities, their insecurities, or deepest desires to the man. This is important for later, so put a pin in it. 
It's also important to express two other connections that Maruki has that are related to the Phantom Thieves. The first is with the major antagonist of the game, Shido. Give a brief rundown, Shido was the bigwig politician that Joker stopped from assaulting a woman at the beginning of the game's story, caused Joker to be put in a situation he is right now, stuck in a new city, forced to leave his previous school behind, and if he steps out of line, he'll go to Juvie. And he's one of the last palace owners you have to face in the game as well. So what does Shido have to do with Maruki? Well, as it turns out, when Maruki was researching cognitive science in his research days, all his findings were taken by Shido. It's one of the perks of being a high-profile politician that had the pool to have Maruki's research be rejected and revoked under the false pretense that there was a lack of evidence to support his theories. Listen, due to the lack of concrete evidence, all further research and funding in the field of cognitive science will cease. <sighs> they told me it's already over and done with. But why now, of all times? When they first saw my paper, they were positively beaming with excitement! So yeah, his research was stolen by one of the biggest jackasses in the game. It wouldn't be until the day that the Phantom Thieves saved the world that he'd learned the truth. The psychotic breakdown incidents. The sudden changes of heart in adults that the Phantom Thieves claim to make. I'm nearly willing to call these events concrete evidence of cognitive science in action. How about you? <sighs> And the one person pulling the strings in the background of this, Congressman Masayo Shishido. He seems to be confessing to all sorts of crimes now that the Phantom Thieves have changed his heart. Years ago, Shido took notice of my research, stole it away from me, and made others develop it for his own gain. Not only that, he used cognitive science somehow to induce the politically motivated psychotic breakdowns. It was also that day that he would actively awaken to his powers as well. Finally at hand, I am the other you, dwelling in the realm of mankind's hearts. The other... me? Wait, the realm of mankind's hearts? Are you telling me that this realm is... You may have no knowledge of it. But I have been at your side for much longer than our current meeting. Of course, we're getting our head of ourselves again. There's another character that has a connection to the Phantom Thieves and Maruki. That is Kasumi. Or rather, yeah, again, major spoilers for the game. I'll give you a few moments before we continue. So, how about them Knicks? Alright, I think that's about enough time. So in the game, Kasumi is also a new confidant that you can get. She's a gymnast in training who isn't as it seems. Because as it turns out, the real Kasumi is dead. And the character we've been interacting with is actually her younger sister, Sumeri. Who blames herself for the death of her sister, since Kasumi pushed Sumeri out of the way of an oncoming vehicle. Even Sojuro, your caretaker in the game, mentions this at the beginning of it, and he points out this incident. Oh. Another accident. So that's why it's so crowded. There's been a lot of those lately. In fact, there was a real sad one just last month. It happened before you came here. If I remember right, the girl that passed away was only 15. Her parents have got to be just... Obviously, the trauma of that event had weighed heavily on Sumeri's heart, to the point where she couldn't live with herself and want to take up Kasumi's dream of being a gymnast, but really couldn't. At least, not until she met Maruki. And it was during that meeting that Maruki was able to manifest his power even stronger. Sometimes, I can't help but think things would have been better if I were Kasumi Yoshizawa. After all, just wishing to make her dream come true does nothing for her in reality. Dr. Maruki, I... I want to become Kasumi. I know. And I'm sure you can too. Just... Believe in yourself. <sighs> now, I point this out to showcase that Maruki was placed into the story rather naturally, if you ask me, and was built up over the course of Persona 5 Royal with connections to the party of the game and even one of the major antagonists, too. Not only does this apply a bond to some degree, but it also allows Maruki to understand the desires of the party for what he wants to do with his powers, and it also shows that there's a bit of a parallel between him and Joker because they were both screwed over by the same guy who wanted to, you know, abuse his power in different ways. 
We're also shown that while he has his own troubles deep down, Maruki genuinely wants to help people who come to him, and that will extend to Maruki's motivations for later in the game. I say this to express that Maruki has a caring nature, but sometimes that can be a detriment, or even lead someone into more villainous natures. There's always been a bit of a debate on my channel, and that's the difference between antagonist and villain. It's a question that people will constantly talk about whenever I make a video or comment about how some characters are one or the other. Hell, when I made a community post, I had people saying that Maruki is not a villain, he's an antagonist. And hell, some people even outright told me that Adam from Hasman Hotel isn't a villain, because he isn't the main villain, and some other dumb reasons. And I get the feeling that people are going to do the same with this video. How Maruki isn't a villain simply because of his views and choices aren't done out of malice, but rather he wants to help not only at the cast, but the world. Hell, when I talked about Persona 5 Royal back in the day, I recall people arguing that Maruki was right. And that some people will equate that to him not being a villain. Obviously, I do not agree with that, and I will explain later, but we need to get into the main topic of this section, Maruki. So I explained in the last section that Maruki awoke to his powers when the Phantom Thieves were saving the world from the God of Control. However, when they toppled the God... <laughs> Maruki, who had earned a bond with each of the Phantom Thieves, was able to gain the powers of the God of Control when the original one was defeated. It's a bit complicated, but since the Phantom Thieves all found Maruki as an outlet for the issues they had expressed in the story, they considered him to be a person they could trust and rely on. And thanks to the cognition they had of him, he gained the powers of the God of Control. And what did Maruki do with this power? He took away the sorrows and warped reality for more than just the Phantom Thieves, but for almost all Japan and even the world. Focusing on the Phantom Thieves, Maruki practically warps the reality to bring back the dead to life, bringing back people like Futaba's mother, father, Haru's father, and of course... And you're supposed to be dead. I got better? There are other things such as erasing Ryuji's injury, making it that Shiho's run-in with Kamoshida never happened, and even a former villain, Madarame, seems to have fully reformed and is teaching Yusuke art. Oh, and Morgana turned into a human and is violating my personal space now. And to make things more interesting, you seem to be the only one who's noticing these obvious changes to the world. After all, people like Utawa's mother are supposed to be dead. As sad as it is, although to be fair, Akechi and Yoshizawa also notice things that aren't right. But that's beside the point. With this power now at his fingertips, Maruki is able to do this. But with Joker being one of the few people who was unaffected by his powers, you're kind of throwing a wrench in his plan. So here's the thing. Maruki doesn't want to force you into his ideal world. He does have the ability to do it, but he would rather you agree with him with his methods and philosophy, as well as how things should be. Remember when I was talking about the Arcana, the Counselor Arcana? This actually correlates back to the list of traits that I was talking about when it comes to the specific suit of the Arcana. Diplomacy, possibility of choice, persuasion, and power for mental illness. Each of these actually does a good job of describing Maruki's motivations and reasons for what he does. Let's go back to the God of Control, the Holy Grail. Yabadawleth. I'm sorry, I can never pronounce his name. His motivations for what he was doing was due to the belief that free will is the source of mankind's suffering, whereas Maruki, on the other hand, believes that all desires are what's causing the suffering. Stuff like people's wishes, ambitions, and etc. And because there are times where you fail at them, that causes that pain. So what does Maruki do? He creates a world where everyone's desires are achieved, no strings attached, at least none would actually affect the people who are affected by him. In fact, the only one who would get a negative repercussion would be Maruki himself, as when this power is used, any and all memories of him fade away from those who are affected by his power, at least for the most part. And even with all this, Maruki doesn't do this out of a selfish need or with malice. His goal is to save people, preventing pain and suffering in the world. The game even gives you the option of siding with Maruki if you want, and you get an ending where the dream world that Maruki creates continues, and everyone is happy. Granted, if you miss the deadline in the palace or just don't complete it, Maruki will still win by putting Joker to sleep. No, he doesn't kill Joker, he just makes Joker sleep forever, with the conclusion being that Joker was suffering by being forced to have the choice. However, Maruki doesn't want to fight the Phantom Thieves. As we went over, they were his patients and he genuinely cares about them. It's why he spends so much time trying to convince the Phantom Thieves to his side. Even when you're fighting with him, he pleads with the thieves. So come to Kuna. You dream of running. Running would make life so much easier for your mother. I can make that dream your reality. Yeah? Well, too bad for you! I'm done with- I know you don't really want your approval to be earned through force. You want a world guided by beauty. 
and I use such a world. I have my friends by my side in this world. I don't need another world forced upon me. Niji Masan, everyone has the right to wish for a happy family. You don't need to keep holding back your desires. I'll fulfill my desire for a happy family with my own power. We're also told by Lavenza, a denizen of the Velvet Room, that Maruki has the ability to erase the Phantom Thieves from existence, just like the previous God of Control tried to do. But he doesn't do that. He tries to convince you that he's right, and that it would be better for humanity in his dream world. The whole point of Maruki in the third semester is to propose a question to the audience. What is the right thing to do if you had this power? Because if we're thinking about it, Maruki's goal is a good one, wanting to prevent people's suffering. But should that mean that everything that has happened to the Phantom Thieves should be erased? If it wasn't for the suffering that they all endured, they wouldn't have met. They wouldn't have become friends. It's here I want to talk about Maruki as a villain, because a lot of the people will probably say in the comments that he isn't one. He's an antagonist because his goals and motivations aren't set in malice. And I would agree with that, but the motivations and goals aren't the issue here and what I would consider him to be a villain. Rather, it's his methodology that makes him into a villain. A good-natured villain for sure, but still a villain. What do I mean by this? Let's consider all the previous villains in the base game, and the rest of the story of Persona 5. One of the overarching themes of Persona 5's narrative is that those in power will exert their wills over others and will often oppress people under them. Most of the palace owners in this game were adults who had positions of power and misused their power to force their wills onto others. Kamushida was a teacher who abused his authority over students, even to sexual natures. Madarame was a famous artist who stole from those who learned from him and exploited them for monetary gain. Kaneshiro was a part of the Mafia, who extorted countless times and used intimidation tactics, even on students. Okumura was a business tycoon who worked his employees harshly, and was even willing to give his daughter away just so he could improve his standing in the world. Shido was a corrupt politician who used anyone he could just so he could gain political power, even going so far as to kill people and steal people's research. And the God of Control? Well, I don't think I have to really explain that one. And Maruki is actually the same. The only difference is that he isn't doing it out of selfish reasons, and genuinely cares about the people he's helping. But how can I still say he's a villain? Let's consider the following. Maruki is using his powers to help everyone live a happy life. Keyword being... Everyone. I doubt people would really care if Maruki was using his powers to help fix some of the worst issues that had no solutions to them that were tangible by normal means. It's pretty much what the Phantom Thieves did throughout the story, but that isn't what Maruki is doing now, is it? No, rather, what he's doing is reconstructing the entire world to fit what he views as happy, completely changing people's lives, and to some extent even erasing their personalities. One of the core beliefs that Maruki holds is that if people have a difficult dream that they wish to fulfill and it's challenging, you should drop this dream and pursue an easier one. We learn this in the psychological exam section of his palace, where the correct answer is to give up on your dream if it's too hard. Instead of taking risks, people should choose the safest path. That is Maruki's philosophy, and with this new power, that's what Maruki instills into the people of the world. I should also point out that Maruki has no problem with overriding someone's personality in this world. We see this with Sumere, but in the ending, when you agree with Maruki and get a happy world, the same thing happens to Akechi where he loses his personality and becomes a puppet. In a sense, while Maruki's motivations are coming from a good place, the way he wants to go about it is the same as if the God of Control before him. After all, he's doing this without people's consent. But here's the rub. The third semester is written to propose a question to the audience playing. Because there are people who do believe that Maruki is in the right despite this. And others believe that the Phantom Thieves are in the right. And that's what makes Maruki a great villain. Sure, you can say he's not evil and only wants the best for everyone. However, there's a phrase I'm reminded of when I hear that. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. Maruki is actively changing the lives of other people, and unlike the Phantom Thieves who went after people who were proven to be evil and hurt others, Maruki is affecting everyone in the world, and he's doing it so people can live under the world that he decides. It's your life, but he chooses how you live it, and you don't even know it. Again, here's the thing. This is what makes Maruki an interesting villain. Yes, he's not evil, and he's not aiming to do this out of selfish motivations, but the way he's going about this has the totalitarian element to it. Maruki is in that odd spot where you understand where he's coming from, 
and you can also agree with his motivations, but his actions are what make you disagree with him and also makes him into a villain. Of course, there are other things about Maruki that I find amazing and add to his villainous nature, such as hypocrisy. It should be known that while being a hypocrite in real life is a bad thing, a character being a hypocrite isn't exactly the worst thing in the world. In fact, it can also be compelling when it comes to character writing, especially for villains and antagonists. I thought you believed in gun control. Yes, I believe I should control the gun. It's the men who need to be checked. Jesus, I sh shot myself! Protagonists and characters I'm supposed to like? Eh, not so much. But why is this? To make it easy, it's a rules for thee, not for me instance. And also reinforces the idea of a character being a villain to me. Since if they have standards for why they do the things they do, then it makes it hard for me to believe that they really do the things they do for good of others. And yes, Maruki is a hypocrite. I want to preface by saying that it doesn't make Maruki a bad character or even a bad villain. In fact, it makes him all the more compelling since it leads into a self-delusional god complex. Let's start with something simple. Maruki not willing to fight the Phantom Thieves. First, let's consider the fact that one of the bad endings is that if you don't finish his palace or don't actually give an answer, he'll put Joker to eternal sleep. In all honesty, I really wanted you to accept my gift of your own free will, but I see that demanding a decision from you is only making you suffer. That was never my intention, so don't worry. There's no need to obsess over it anymore. I'll bring you your happiness. And then there's the fact that in a proper fight, he'll choose to kill the thieves if it means that his world will become a fixed element. But let's really consider Shido. Maruki claims that he's making a world where everyone can be happy, with their dreams being fulfilled by Maruki's powers. So by that logic, you'd think someone like Shido would be affected as well. No, not exactly. We learn from Akechi only Shido's imprisoned for the psychotic breakdowns that occurred in the game. Now, you can argue that this is justified since Shido really did a lot of terrible things, such as getting Joker arrested for interfering with his assault of a woman, Shido stealing Maruki's research, and Shido's actions causing literally the death of people. Yes, it's justified, but it's still hypocritical. And this leads into the greater hypocrisy that Akechi points out in the game. A world where everyone is happy is impossible to achieve, since people's desires will naturally conflict with each other. Shido is proof of this since his desires were proven to hurt others. You literally cannot make a world where everyone is happy because people's desires will actually intersect with each other. I feel the need to point out that other villains, i.e. Madarame and Okumura, Characters who had taken advantage of numerous people, even people who were considered family and actual family, were given a second chance to be better people. Even by the sheer fact that the Phantom Thieves are against Maruki's actions are proof of this, and when called out on it, Maruki doesn't really respond to it. He's the one who chooses who gets to be happy. He's the one who chooses how people should be happy and how they live their lives. And it's even exemplified with Sumeri. She explicitly tells Maruki that she wants to start living as herself instead of being the shadow of Kasumi. But Maruki is unwilling to go back on his decisions with her. You have someone telling you that they do not want to go back to being someone else. But Maruki believes that she'd be happier as Kasumi. Maruki even tries using Sumiri's trauma to guilt trip Joker and Akechi, and even Akechi's potential existence to convince Joker to agree with him. It's manipulation, and it really highlights Maruki's hypocrisy in the matter. He wants the best for everyone, but is willing to use tactics that honestly go against his claims of wanting to help people. Of course, there is one element of Maruki's character that I haven't really talked about in this video, and I really wanted to say it for this section, and that's Rumi. Who's Rumi? Rumi was Maruki's former girlfriend. I say former since she was the first person that Maruki was able to use his powers on. Rumi had fallen into a catatonic state after a break-in happened that took the lives of her parents an event so traumatizing to her that she broke down whenever she had a moment of breakthrough. My family... Dad... Mom... No... Please... Please don't go! Ah! This was when Maruki had subconsciously awoken to his powers of actualization to change her cognition to forget what happened, and in turn, make her forget about him. Now, why do I bring up this tragic event, an event where Maruki sacrifices a chance to be with the woman he loves to prevent her suffering? And make no mistake, he had a chance to restart his relationship with Rumi. Um, so I know this might sound odd, but if you'd like to meet again sometime... Thank you for the offer, but... I'm sorry. I'm going to be getting busier than ever soon, so I don't believe we'll be meeting again but he turned it down. And the moment he says that his girlfriend has passed away, which, yeah, she kinda did, Rumi loses her portrait, becoming just a faceless NPC in the game. It's for one line, sure, but throughout this scene, portraits were used for both Maruki and Rumi in this. It's a deliberate choice to show that she no longer has connection with him. But how is this hypocritical? 
because Maruki realizes that he can't be with her, especially with painful memories of Rumi's trauma, and after learning about his powers to do so, Maruki understands that a relationship would get in the way of all that, and thus, Maruki knows deep down that a perfect world cannot exist, making the world perfect for someone would make it worse for another. To top it off, Maruki believes that his sacrifice was necessary, and rationalizes it that it was necessary for him to get his powers and current mindset, despite the fact that the Phantom Thieves are arguing the same thing against Maruki's perfect world, that the hardships and trials that the thieves went through were necessary for them to grow as people. And deep down, Maruki knows that he's built his castle on a pillar of sand. What is one of the first things he cries out when you're doing a fistfight with Maruki after you defeat him and his palace is crumbling? Why? Why, Rumi? A world where everyone is happy is impossible. Not without some little hypocrisy sprinkled in. There are even statues of Rumi in his palace, and the true form of Maruki's treasure was the newsletter that talked about the murder of Rumi's family the event that started Maruki's troubles and abilities. A world where there's no suffering, built upon the suffering of the one building it. It's a sad tale of hypocrisy. It's really important to talk about the music when it comes to Persona 5 Royal, especially when it comes to Maruki, since it acts as a means of theming for the audience when they involve themselves with the good doctor, even when you're fighting Maruki. Also, if this segment sounds familiar, a lot of it has the same structure as when I talked about the music back in my Persona 5 Royal video a few years ago. So, let's talk about Throw Your Mask Away shows Maruki's motivations. Don't sleep through dreams that can come true. No more tears shall drop from the cheeks anymore. You want me to strive for greatness. Believe in me that you the lyrics obviously imply that Maruki is attempting to remove sadness from the world, begging the Phantom Thieves for them to stop trying to interfere with him helping. The song has a calming nature to it, with a piano which sounds foreboding but also has a soothing nature too, and there are times in the song where it feels soft and a lot more subdued melody and instruments are used. I can almost picture Maruki extending his hand in peace, which is reflective of how throughout the third semester, Maruki has been attempting to plead for the thieves to come to his way of thinking. Of course, when you talk about Maruki, you need to bring up the Phantom Thieves as well, and how their music acts as a counter to him. I believe is the song for that. <laughs> The song is evolution of Life Will Change, even adopting some familiar chords. And incorporating some lyrics too. Really, the song has a bit of a theme that goes along with the idea of rebellion that is present throughout the original story of Persona 5. One of the most prominent themes in the story, to me, was the idea of rebelling against various types of authority. I won't go through them all again, but considering that Maruki is making himself to be the authority of what would make people happy, as we've established in this video, this makes Maruki out to be a villain, at least in my eyes. Even if there's no malicious intent, it's still a form of controlling people against their will, something that Maruki is willing to exert over, and, I believe, has lyrics that represent the rebellious nature against his kindness. It's time to show everything we got to find a way out from this evening rush. A life is happening in front of you right now. It's time to see. Even if it makes people happy, it's a fake happiness, and it was a choice that was taken out of people's hands. And even though it's been a tough journey, it's one that has moved all its ups. It's our turn to get back to grab the future which we fully believe and is not given to us. It's earned. The Phantom Thieves have fought countless battles, changed the hearts of so many people who are hurt by others, and through it all, they earned what they have. Battling against countless enemies and practically facing against the world itself and coming out on top.
It's also important to note when I Believe plays. There are only two times that the song actually activates in the game. The first is when the thieves are infiltrating Maruki's palace after the calling card was delivered, replacing Life Will Change, and the other is when the group is going against Maruki's incredibly strong attack in the final battle. And thus, with a single bullet, Joker shatters the false reality. When a song plays just that, it can be as insignificant as what the song says as well, as it empowers what we the viewers are seeing on the screen. Both these songs illustrate the conflict between the two ideologies, offering the choice to the audience at the same time. Do you wish to live a beautiful lie, or grow from the scars that were given from your past and become stronger? The choice is yours. Hey there! I'm that one stick figure guy, and Maruki alongside Persona 5 in general is something I'll always be able to gush about endlessly. When discussing his role in this game as a whole though, there's one aspect that sticks out to me in a lot of the game's subtext. You see, if you ask any layman what the major theme of Persona 5 is, you'll get an obvious assortment of answers. Rebellion, society, the color red. But one that I don't as often see explicitly referenced is the game's strong messaging about individuality. And this particular theme is where Maruki's role in the story becomes far more menacing than we normally consider. You see, the game starts off with a clear thesis statement in the opening arc. Each individual person has their own struggles, their own desires, their own history, and their own impact on the world. And even if it takes a collective effort to overcome an oppressive force within society, it's still the will of the individuals which colors that rebellion. Ryuji, for example, makes a clear effort to remember and rescue each member of the volleyball team and tries in his own brash way to protect them all from the abuse he's all too familiar with based on his own history. And with On, the justice carried out on Kamishida could have played out very differently if she hadn't spared him and clung to her earnest sense of justice, even if killing him could have satiated that understandable hatred she felt towards him. My point with this being, the experiences and struggles of each person are paramount in defining who they are, and Persona 5 makes a clear argument for the good that comes from embracing those aspects of yourself, and using your identity to help those around you. So where does Maruki fit into all of this? Well, do you ever think about why Maruki takes the role of the god of control of all things? Rather than being paralleled with someone like Kamashida or even Futaba, why Yaudaba? You know, outside of the literal text of the story with the thieves relying on him transferring that power, but rather the parallel aspects between our gentle doctor and the sterling behemoth Yadabel. While it's totally understandable to say Maruki isn't a villain, that's kind of been the crux of most discussions surrounding this man. As hard as it is to acknowledge, if you consider Maruki's goals and methods to be virtuous and the correct moral path, then it's hard to turn around and claim that Yadabel was wrong. Takato Maruki and Yadabel are two sides of the same coin. And even aside from the incidental role he landed in, Maruki fits the bill of a god of control perfectly. When you boil it down, Yadavath's philosophy is pretty simple. Mankind is doomed to spiral and self-destruct, and the purveyance of desires onto man has caused more suffering than can even be described. And heck, that's exactly what you've been fighting against the whole game, isn't it? People misusing their individual desires and twisting them into ego, pushing down and oppressing the average person for their own benefit. And this is the world that Yaudabath seeks to end, to choose the peaceful stagnation of mankind over its current entropy. After all, he is the direct manifestation of the will of the masses. He is the treasure they desire. Stagnant peace. And isn't that exactly what Maruki is seeking? Maruki targets an explicit goal of making a blissful paradise for everyone, making their greatest dreams come true. Though, two things immediately come to mind with that. As Common said earlier, the ways in which Maruki develops this utopia are, well, hypocritical. He subjects those who he sees as destructive to his ideology to a lesser future, excluding them from his mercy. Not so different from Yaudabout's expulsion of the Phantom Thieves from reality. Because after all, their core value of individual growth and the ability to manifest that will however they please, regardless of whatever self-righteous justification a person has, is antithetical to the world they're trying to create. Hand in hand with that thought, if we're looking at this new reality as it's presented, Maruki's perfect reality is not much different than Yaudi's, because even if Yaudabath doesn't promise objective wish fulfillment past that carnal desire for thoughtless peace, ignorance itself is bliss, is it not? Maruki's promise to humanity is all the same, but with a nice little bow that makes the optics of it all just a bit more pleasing. And if you think I'm stretching things a bit or that I'm implying that Maruki rejects individualism, 
well, no, I'm not implying it. I'm outright saying it. Earlier on in the game, before Maruki takes hold of Mementos, the doc comes into your class for a day to teach a lesson. Now, if you weren't one of the people who just skips past these class lessons and actually reads what he has to say, this specific lesson would easily catch your attention. Maruki speaks on the topic of totalitarianism, or, you know, dictatorships, but more notably, speaks about it in a shockingly favorable light, focusing on all the benefits of that single ideological rule first and foremost, and only after suggesting that this kind of thinking may have some drawbacks, forcing ideals onto others and assimilating the unwilling into a singular cause, extinguishing individualism. This was clearly on his mind throughout the entire game, so him taking on the role of Yaudabaoth wasn't ironic. It wasn't his goodwill and generosity that makes this an unexpected result. No one man could have better fit into the Holy Grail shoes than Maraki himself. He is, for all intents and purposes, Yaudabaoth with a smile. The only major difference between the two is that we see Maraki through a lens of sympathy. He is our friend, our confidant. And the distinction is seen where he acts less so out of aggressive egoism, but from a state of compassion and pity. It's hard to name a more emotionally driven character within the game, especially with someone who's repressing so much. Yet, despite the emotions that contextualize his actions, he's still vying for that perfect totalitarian rule. He wants a world of sloth where people don't have to worry or even think about worrying. And even if he sees himself as a martyr for having to sit on that throne rather than being a victor, he's still choosing to be on that throne. A selfish choice made from his own perceived selflessness. Takato Maruki, regardless of the good intent he harbors, is a stark antithesis to the game's thesis of the value of individualism. And I couldn't name a more perfect final opponent for the Thieves than for them to stand for their ideals one last time against someone they know truly believes they're following their own justice. I love this game. Anywho, back to common. Peace out. Maruki is a villain. But he's a great villain, especially in the Persona franchise, and frankly speaking, I appreciate him as a character because he makes you think. He makes you question your own thoughts about the world and if it's necessary for people to go through the pain and suffering of life just so they can continue onwards. I personally disagree with Maruki's mindset. I believe that what doesn't kill you can make you stronger, and at the end of the day, I can appreciate that a villain like Maruki can instill a conversation like this. That's what a great villain does. You can see where they're coming from, you can see what caused them to do this, and it makes you think. Now, this isn't the only way to make a great villain, but it really all depends on what kind of story you want to tell. A villain like Yoshikage Kira is meant to talk about how evil isn't always going to be represented by a dark face, but could be disguised by some nobody in the crowd. Doflamingo is a tale of how corrupt worlds can make monsters out of people. Armstrong is just an entertaining villain who may have a point about how the culture has devolved into sludge, but how he goes about fixing the issue is done to extremes. And Maruki? He's a villain that makes you question if you should stop him at first, but when you really look at the character and consider his actions and motivations, while he may have a good intention, he is a villain with a warm smile. This is my opinion on the character, of course. I enjoy Maruki as a character and a villain, and I do believe that he's probably one of the best villains in the Persona series, especially since he's more human and brings up interesting questions. Then again, I'm sure there are people who will disagree with me, as the world of Persona in video games is extremely large and spanning. Who knows, maybe if I'm told enough reasons, maybe get about 10k likes in this video, and maybe if you put in the comments section, Maruki is awesome, maybe look into other villains of the Persona series. Or if you want me to cover another villain, maybe consider putting... I don't know, One Winged Angel in the description? I don't know, I'd love to talk about him too. I always love looking to villains, this is no exception. I'm Manga Common, and thanks for watching. Peace out, my friends.